Hi. Um, in 1999, Georgia Tech faculty decided that every single student who walked onto our campus had to take a course in computer science, and explicitly one that involved programming. That includes the students that you wouldn't necessarily think about as taking programming classes, like the students in the liberal arts, architecture, and management programs. Uh, for the first few years that we had this requirement, there was one and only one course that met that requirement. Why not? There's only one computer, right? There's only one kind of computer science. Overall, the course had a success rate of around 80%, which is pretty good for an intro course in any subject, until you look at the liberal arts, architecture, and management majors. In those majors, students passed at a rate of about 50% or less. Um, in architecture, it was 47%. In management, it was 48%. Management students started talking about three-peating the course. By the third time, you almost always passed. This is a real problem. What we realized was that there isn't just one computer. There's not just one kind of computer science. For students in liberal arts, architecture, and management programs, the computer is less a tool of computation or calculation as it is a tool of communication. How would we teach computer science for a focus on communication, on using the computer for expression, because that's what these students were most interested in? So we realized that we needed to teach a different kind of computer science, one that was explicitly aimed at the communicators, explicitly aimed at the people who want to figure out how to express themselves and how people are hearing them. So I want to give you a concrete example about what this course is about, where the idea of the course is to prepare students to be literate for the 21st century, to give them computer science programming, which is key to 21st century um, literacy. So I want to give you a concrete example so that you could look at it and say, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Programming for liberal arts, architecture, and management majors does make sense. It is part of 21st century literacy. I'm going to talk to you explicitly about how computer science helps us understand how we hear, how we see, and how we think about information in our world. So let's start out with hearing. This is a tool that we actually use in the class. And what we're seeing right now is sound. Now, the way that sound works, I'm guessing many of the people in the room realize, so bear with me. Um, right now, my vocal cords are bouncing against air molecules, and these air molecules are forming waves, and they're crashing towards your ear. And there's compression, there's increase in air pressure, and then there's decreases in air pressure as the, as the airwaves separate. And so we can actually see those here. Watch when I whistle. So what we see is that higher pitch leads to skinnier waves. Skinnier waves means there's more waves per unit time, um, and that's a higher frequency. That's what we call that. So there's more waves per unit time, higher frequency, higher pitch. When it had a lower pitch, we had fatter waves. There were fewer waves per unit time, lower frequency, lower pitch. Now, that's the way that, that the frequency and pitch works. Volume is a little bit different. Let me show you a different view in order to see volume. Volume is determined by the height of the wave, the difference between the lowest part to the highest part. In this view, what I'm going to be showing you is um, frequency increases from the bottom to the top, and the amount of darkness gives us the amount of volume or energy at that particular frequency. <whistles> sort of audio etch-a-sketch. <laughs> now notice when when you have a normal tone, there's a lot of different frequencies that are going on there. A whistle is almost a perfect sine wave, a perfect frequency. But human voice actually has a lot of frequencies in it. Natural sounds in the world have, have a lot of frequencies in them, but not all at the same volume. Uh, when we create musical instruments, the musical instruments that we most like are musical instruments that have similar characteristics in terms of having lots of frequencies in them, that are having a pattern to them. Now, one of the cool things that we can do in the class is that this is indicating where the sine waves are in a harmonica sound. We could actually just sum up sine waves. We could actually create a harmonica sound out of just playing around with some math. In fact, you could also then make a sound that was like my human voice, or make a sound like nothing that exists in the physical world. You could create new kinds of sounds, new kinds of uh, musical instruments. So let me talk to you about um, how the computer records sounds. So I already have some sounds that I've put in here. Let me just load this up. Explore, test. 
OK, so how do we take this crashing waves and put it into a computer? A computer only understands numbers. So the way that we do it is we take regular samples. We take readings of those air pressures at regular intervals. Um, and we call each of those a sample. And a sample varies between positive 32,767, 32,767, to negative 32,768. Um, and so these, the, the sampling is the critical part, the how often it occurs. For CD quality sound, we capture at um, 44,100 samples per second. And so each of the values in here varies between positive and negative 32,000. How would we make this sound bigger? How would we make the volume bigger? Well, what we'd want is for the top ones to be even more positive and the negative ones to be even more negative. We want to increase it. We want to strengthen the wave, lengthen the wave. Here's a piece of code that does that. To increase the volume of the sound, you want to walk through each of the samples in the sound. And then you want to get that value out of it, and we multiply it by some constant. Here we're going to do four. And that's going to make the positive values bigger and the negative values even more negative. So I'm going to increase volume of test, explore test. OK? And if we look at it, it looks like the waves are bigger. But let's listen to it. Here's the original sound again. This is a test. And here's the louder one. This is a test. I didn't twist the volume knob. Honest. OK? So I'm hoping that you'll trust me. That's a, a, a louder sound. Around this point in my class, students say, how big can we get it? <laughs> how loud can we make the sound? Can we maximize it? Can we make the positive as positive as it will possibly go and as negative as negative as it will possibly go? Sure. Here's a piece of code that'll do that. So for each sample in the sounds, we're going to grab the value out. If it's at all positive, make it the highest possible value. If it's at all negative, make it the lowest possible value. So I'm going to now maximize test, explore test. OK, this sound looks pretty radically different than the original one, all right? You've got to be wondering to yourself, what is that going to sound like? You don't have to cover your ears. In fact, I'd rather use your hand for something else. I want you to make a prediction. When I click play entire sound, are you going to be able to hear the words, this is a test? OK, if you don't think, if you don't think so, give me a thumbs down. If you do think so, give me a thumbs up. OK, hold it there. No, don't get to put it down again. Hold it there. Look at your thumb. OK? Why is that? Why is it that that worked? It's actually not all that complicated. Yes, the amplitude is as wide as it possibly can be, but the frequency hasn't changed the slightest bit. The frequency is exactly the same as what it was. It turns out that our perception of speech is mostly based on frequency, not based on amplitude at all. Now, think about this figure, too, as a computer scientist. How many bits per sample are there? A bit, we know, is the lowest possible piece of information. That's how computers work. A bit is either on or off, 1 or 0. Ignore the fact that this is positive 32,767, negative 32,768. There's only two values here. It's either the most positive or the most negative. Folks, you can record completely legible speech with only a single bit per sample. That works. That's pretty wild. That's, the, what ha that's something about how our ears work. Okay. Next thing, let me talk to you about the way our eyes work. Let me grab a picture. OK? Um, the way that we put pictures onto a computer is we break them into little tiny pieces called pixels, which you can only see if you take a, a, a magnifying glass to the screen or if you zoom it up a lot. We're going to zoom this one up to 500%. OK, each of these pixels, each of these little tiny dots, has an amount of redness, an amount of greenness, an amount of blueness. So a light colored pixel, like down here, is going to have really high values. And a dark colored pixel is going to have fairly low values. OK? Why red, green, and blue? Because that's the way our human eyes work. We have three kinds of color sensors in our eyes. We basically can detect red, green, or blue. Dogs are not colorblind. Dogs have two kinds of color sensors. They see a different range of colors than we do. Butterflies have, depending on the butterfly, between 5 and 14 color sensors. A butterfly can look at the same picture as you and I and see colors that you and I can't even imagine. OK? Now, we can mess with the pixels here. In particular, think about what does it mean to negate this picture? What does it mean to get the negative of a picture? 
Here's a piece of code that's going to do that. Each of those red, green, and blue vary between 0 and 255. So 255 minus the red is the negative of the red. 255 minus the green is the negative of that. 255 minus the blue is the, is the negative of the blue. So we're going to get in this program, we're going to get each of the pixels. We're going to get its redness, its greenness, and its blueness. And then we'll set the red, the green, and the blue back to 255 minus that. So let me negate barb. And then explore barb again. OK? That's how negative works. It's also kind of funny that people giggle. How often do you giggle in computer science class when programming? All right, now, um, this is an awful way to leave my lovely wife. It turns out that negation is an information-preserving transformation. We haven't lost any information here. So if we negate barb again and explore barb again, we get the original again. We get that back. Now, not all transformations that one might do in Photoshop or anywhere else are information-preserving. In particular, computing the grayscale actually is information loss, lossy. We lose information when we do this. So how do we create grayscale? What does grayscale mean anyway? It turns out if the red and the green and the blue all equal the same value, you get a value of gray. But what value do you need? Basically, you want a value that indicates how dark that pixel is. And it turns out this is kind of cool. Simply taking the average of the red, the green, and the blue is a reasonable measure of luminance. And we could get a grayscale picture of Barbara simply by computing the luminance of that. It turns out that mostly most of the, the filters which are in Photoshop are some variation of this function. We're going to get the red, the green, and the blue out, and then we do something the red, the green, and the blue and put it back again. Okay? So maybe what we would do, here's our, our change function, maybe what we want to do is double the red. Maybe we want to make the green equal to the green plus the blue, and where we would have blue, we want to instead take the green value. I'm going to save this. And then I'm going to say, go change barb. <coughs> and now let's explore barb. OK? Sort of a sun-drenched look. Um, can you do this in Photoshop? Probably, but maybe not. Maybe we've just invented a new filter. And it was really easy to do. We can invent something which might not exist in Photoshop and create it all for ourselves. So how we hear, how we see. The last thing, how we think about information. Information is actually a part, it's completely separate from any modality. I'm showing you pictures, I'm showing you sounds, but information is completely apart from that. Let me prove it to you. Let me turn a picture into a sound. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a sound and I'm going to take an empty picture. I'm going to make a correspondence, a mapping between each of the pixels and a sample. As I take each of the pixels in this empty picture, I'm going to grab another sample from the sound. If the value of that sample is greater than, is, going, is less than negative 2,000, I'm going to make the corresponding pixel blue. If it's greater than 2,000, I'm going to make the pixel red. If it's in between, I'm going to make the pixel green. Okay, do you everybody follow the mapping? It's not really that complicated. Here's the code that does that. Now, this is the most complicated code that I've shown you, but I'm hoping that you'll trust me that it's basically doing the same thing. Don't trust me, actually try to figure it out. Um, we're going to grab the empty picture. We're going to have a sound index that are going to count each of the sounds. We're going to grab all the pixels. If we run out of sound, we stop. Otherwise, get the sample value at the sound index. If it's greater than 2,000, make it red. Negative 2,000, make it blue. Between, make it green. Go on to the next sound index. This is the most complicated program we've seen, but it's really only a little bit longer than a sonnet, and I think it's easier to read than Shakespeare. All right, so what I want to do is go get our sound again. Test equals make sound. This is a test.wave. And let me play that just to prove to you that's the same this thing. Is a test. And then I'm going to make a picture, P equals sound to picture of test. And I'm going to show you P. I think you could trust me. This is a test. Now, you say, OK, cool, Guzdal, but you know, those graphs you showed us previously, isn't that the same thing? Didn't you just take a sound and turn it into a picture? What's so exciting about that? How about if we go back again? Uh. How about if we take a picture and turn it back into a sound? We're going to take an empty sound. We're going to walk through all the pixels again. If the pixel is mostly red, we make it 2,000. If it's mostly blue, we're going to make it negative 2,000. If it's in between, we're going to make it zero. 
Okay? So now what I'm going to do is take that picture, I'm going to create a new sound, equals picture to sound of P. Explore new sound. Pretty low volume, 2,000 is not very high. Okay, will we hear the words? Come on, folks, we got three values now. That's way more than two, no problem. That is a sound that we just took out of a picture, right? And you didn't, I didn't call the function with the sound again. The, picture, the sound was only in the picture. We could have all kinds of cool mappings between sounds and pictures. I mean, who knows what kind of mapping Leonardo da Vinci did when he embedded orchestras inside of Mona Lisa. Go check, see if you can find them. So um, digital information can be easily mapped between modalities. Uh, we could grab different kinds of information and turn it into a sound. Maybe we should take temperature readings and turn them into a sound so that you could hear climate change. Maybe we should take stock market prices and turn them into sounds because our ears can sometimes hear patterns that our eyes can't see. And that's one of the powerful ideas about using a computer to manipulate information. We can switch between modalities pretty easily. Now, none of the programs I've shown you today are very long or very complicated. And I'm not trying to say that this is good software. I'm not trying to teach my students who are liberal arts, architecture, and management majors how to be, write good code. They don't want to be software engineers. If there was a class for computer science majors, yes, I want them to be great software engineers. I, know how to, I want them to be able to write good code. But that's not my point here. My point here is that they can use programs to understand their world, to manipulate their world. I think that we want to think about computers, human uh, programming, human readable programs, as being like microscopes and telescopes. In the 20th century, you wouldn't teach science and tell kids you can't have a microscope or telescope. Microscopes and telescopes are part of how you see science. In the 21st century, computers are the way that we understand our world. Last week, um, in the UK's The Guardian, John Naughton wrote, we teach elementary physics to every child not primarily to train physicists, but because each of them lives in a world governed by physical systems. We should teach everybody computer science and how to program because they, all of us live in a world where computing is ubiquitous. So at Georgia Tech, we realized that everybody needs to learn computer science. Everybody needs to learn how to program because it's part of 21st century literacy. It's key to innovation in almost every discipline, and the way you think is key to, to um, being able to be globally competitive. Thank you very much.